in real material in any real material sense. And transgender is simply a made up concept that is used to justify all kinds of atrocities. It is in effect, a men's rights movement intended to objectify women's bodies and erase us as a class. It is left-wing misogyny on steroids. I say this as a leftist and a Democrat. At this point, many readers might be thinking, okay, but I have a child, sister, brother, niece, nephew, cousin, friend, etc., who is trans. What should I do about that? Just ignore his, her identity? My answer is this. Your child, sister, brother, niece, nephew, cousin, friend, or whomever is still either female or male, biologically, even if the person has adopted a so-called trans identity. That's what matters. That's what's true in a material, real, objective sense. The person in question can adopt a subjective gender identity if she or he wants to, but that identity is no more real than it would be for you, me, or anyone else to identify as a tree or a chair. Along this journey, I have met numerous parents whose children, both minors and young adults, were struggling with matters of sex and gender. Many of these children appeared to believe that they were, quote, born in the wrong body and that they were in fact the opposite sex. Some simply wanted to escape their biological sex in search of something different. Today, such a phenomenon might seem healthy and normal. It is not. The parents I have met with trans children are in agony. The gender identity industry is feeding their children drugs that will result in permanent sterilization and possible terminal illness. It is subjecting them to surgeries that mutilate, amputate, and destroy healthy body parts. Most of these parents are unable to speak out because they have very legitimate concerns about their relationships with their children and about their children's privacy. So they sit and wait and hope while their children's lives and bodies are being destroyed. This book is for them. From chapter one, what is a woman? On July 28, 2014, journalist Michelle Goldberg published a piece in the New Yorker titled, What is a Woman? The piece dealt with the growing rift between radical feminists and activists who claim that transgender is a meaningful concept. In it, she chronicled an event from 1973 where feminists were discussing the identities of men who claimed to be transsexuals and where feminist Robin Morgan is reported to have stated, and I'm quoting Robin Morgan here, I will not call a male she. 32 years of suffering in this androcentric society and of surviving have earned me the title woman. One walk down the street by a male transvestite, five minutes of his being hassled, which he may enjoy, and then he dares, he dares to think he understands our pain. No. In our mother's names and in our own, we must not call him sister. End of quote. It is commonplace today to say, and to think we have to say, that, quote, trans women are women. But little thought is given to what this assertion really means. When feminists question its meaning, we are told that trans women are women because they say they are. Everyone in society is expected to go along with this fiction. What many people simply don't know, because most media outlets will not cover this topic, is that women, and some men, are routinely fired from jobs, ejected from organizations, banned from social media, and deplatformed from speaking engagements for having the temerity to say that women are female. From chapter two, the legal abolition of sex. Okay, so in this chapter, I go through all the ways in which the US government, including Congress, the Biden administration and the courts is abolishing sex in the law. In all honesty, this chapter is probably way too boring for most readers, especially readers outside the US. But the information has to be documented and to the best of my knowledge, no one has yet brought together all of this material in one place. This chapter does that and then it concludes as follows. Abolishing sex as a meaningful category in the law has grave implications for everyone, but especially for women and girls, which will be explored in the next chapter. 
from chapter three, Implications for Women and Girls of Abolishing Sex. Our nation has not grappled with the long-term impacts of abolishing sex. For example, what will come of the reporting on crime and the reporting of crime statistics as we continue to abolish sex? It has become commonplace for reporters to report on horrific crimes as being committed by women when they were in fact committed by men. One of the most egregious examples, and again, this is one of the areas that's outdated. This was egregious in 2021. Things have only gotten more egregious since. One of the most egregious examples is the reporting on the case of Jacob Nieves, who was convicted in August 2020 of two counts of sexual exploitation of children, one count of distribution of child pornography, and one count of possession of child pornography. Jacob is a man who also claims to identify as a woman. Reports of the story frequently contain headlines, such as this one from the Eagle Tribune in North Andover, Massachusetts. Quote, <clears throat> quote, woman gets 30 years for child sex abuse. The article clarifies that Nieves identifies and lives as a female without explaining what that might mean when referring to a man and uses she and her in describing him. Two of Nieves' victims were under four years old and Nieves apparently told an undercover officer that, quote, no. she had sexually abused two children known to her and sent the un undercover agent images and videos that Nieves had produced, which depicted Nieves sexually abusing one of those children. This is a male child sexual abuser being reported on as though he were a woman in what is presumably an otherwise reputable publication. However, no reader would know that by simply reading the headline. Any average reader would simply assume that these horrible crimes had been committed by a woman. And then I have further examples of that phenomenon. Further, if we abolish sex, what will happen to our ability to conduct necessary public health research? Let's take a hypothetical example to illustrate this point. Let's say that a drug company is conducting a clinical trial of a new drug that has the potential to cure prostate cancer and is offering $500 to men who are willing to participate in the trial. I sign up on the basis of my supposed male gender identity. Remember, in a world where gender identity reigns supreme, the fact that I do not have a prostate is irrelevant. All that matters is that I claim to identify as a man. Under a legal regime, under a legal regime that protects gender identity for all purposes, the drug company would be discriminating against me on the basis of gender identity if it were to deny my participation in the trial. After I sign up, I complete all the necessary paperwork, ticking the box for M, and proceed to take the experimental drug. The drug company then tests the effects of the drug on my body and incorporates the, res the results into its research. The company reports that all testing on men has been completed with positive results and the drug is eventually approved. Would the men who later take the drug to cure their prostate cancer even know that at least one of the test participants was female? Wouldn't they have the right to? Shouldn't they? If readers think this sounds preposterous, that's because it is. And yet, in a world where sex is abolished at the altar of gender identity, there's no reason whatsoever that this could not happen or even become commonplace. Okay, so the chapter then goes into detail about men in women's prisons, men in women's sports, and men in women's shelters. It describes the particular horrors that the abolition of sex is perpetrating on lesbians with input from a group called LGB Fight Back. The chapter continues. When I speak with lesbians, gay men, and bisexual men and women, it is clear that transgenderism is fundamentally at odds with the legal rights and social acceptance of LGB people. There's nothing wrong with having a same-sex attraction, and all of transgender ideology obscures that reality. My hope in including their voices here is that readers will understand the impact of the gender identity industry on LGB people. I am immensely grateful to the members of LGB Fight Back who shared their insights and concerns with me. The simple fact is that all of this follows inevitably 
from the abolition of sex in law and policy. Our society simply cannot protect anyone on the basis of sex, women and girls, including lesbians especially, if we ignore that it exists. The situation is nothing but devastating for women and girls and for lesbians in particular. From chapter four, the abolition of sex in media and discourse. The topics I've been discussing are not generally permitted to be talked about in public. When words like these are spoken, the speaker is often labeled hateful and bigoted, or sometimes racist, fascist, or Nazi. Explanations for these accusations are rarely provided. The closest anyone has ever come to justifying the accusation of racism is that insisting on single sex bathrooms mirrors Jim Crow racial segregation. But this is ridiculous. Men and women are different for the purpose of using the restroom in ways that people of varying racial backgrounds are not different for that purpose. Most of the mainstream US news media has never provided any honest coverage of the feminist critique of gender identity. Whenever the mainstream media covers any story related to sex and gender, the coverage is biased. It is so biased, in fact, that it uses words like trans and transgender with the apparent assumption that everyone knows what those words mean, that they are uncontroversial, that there is a coherent and shared definition of them. When headlines use the phrases trans athletes and transgender athletes, they're almost always referring to men and boys, but virtually no mainstream media outlet will say that. When they refer to healthcare for transgender people, they mean puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgeries that result in sterility and disease, but virtually no mainstream media outlet will say it. To most Americans, these headlines probably sound straightforward. In truth, they are anything but. The social media scene is no better. Posting feminist content has gotten numerous women and a few men suspended from Twitter and banned from Facebook. As noted earlier, Canadian journalist Megan Murphy, editor-in-chief of The Feminist Current, comedy author Graham Linehan, and Kelly, Kelly J. Keen Minchel have all been permanently banned, as have been numerous lesser-known feminists and male friends. That's obviously another example of how this is outdated already. Threats of violence in response to statements about sex and gender that ought to be completely innocuous have become routine. The mainstream media simply will not permit feminists to talk about our rights as women because doing so is deemed to be offensive or hateful. The mainstream media keep us out by simply refusing to platform us. When we try to speak out on social media, we are subjected to punishments, usually suspensions in the case of Facebook and either temporary or permanent bans in the case of Twitter. The abolition of sex has become so entrenched in our society that we're not even allowed to talk about it using traditional modes of communication. I then go on to talk about various other examples of professional silencing, including Canadian Kath Kathleen Lowry, Australian Holly Lawford Smith, Australian Anna Kerr, American Donna Hughes, and others. I talk about legal silencing, including the case of Scottish woman, Marion Millar. And the chapter concludes as follows. That our language has changed so dramatically as to make the natural material reality of sex nearly invisible with so little public debate is astounding. And yet the abolition of sex in language as in law and in the media is occurring so rapidly that it is difficult to discern. It has simply happened right before our eyes. Again, although this hurts everyone, it harms women and girls in particular. If we cannot talk about sex, we cannot talk about sexism. If we cannot talk about sexism, we cannot fight back against it. If we cannot fight against it, we will never achieve liberation. We're all on the losing end of this, but women and girls have the most to lose. If we do not take a stand, we will lose it all for certain. From chapter five, the gender identity industry. Why is this happening? Why are all three branches of the US government abolishing sex in the law? Why are women being forced to cede ground to and share spaces with men under the false pretense they are female? Why are we not permitted to talk about this? Why are the media, which includes many smart and powerful women, misleading and gaslighting us? Why are women losing their jobs for stating that sex is real? 
The answer is that an invisible industry exists that is driving this entire apparatus. And although it operates openly, few people seem to know about it. Obliterating biological sex in the law and throughout society is the starting point. Women's rights and bodies are collateral damage. The gender identity industry is grounded in a vicious blend of woman hatred, science denial, and greed. This statement may seem shocking or outlandish. Bear with me as I explain. And then in the book, I go on to talk about Janice Raymond's fantastic 1979 book, The Transsexual Empire, and the introduction to her 1994 republication. I discuss the emergence of queer theory in US academia, and then I continue. So how did an obscure and nonsensical academic theory go from the ivory tower to everyone's living rooms, classrooms, and boardrooms, and throughout the law itself? I would argue that once the academy succeeded in queering the sex binary, three things happened that would create the necessary conditions for the contemporary abolition of sex in law and throughout society. One, the invention of the word transgender. Two, the explosion of corporate-driven technologies and medical practices. And three, the thorough embrace of the sexual exploitation of women and girls on the political left. If someone had tried to sell Americans the idea that sex isn't real, by quoting some harebrained scheme cooked up by a handful of off-the-wall academics, it never would have succeeded. Everyone, after all, knows how babies are made. In order to accomplish the goal of persuading Americans to go along with the pretense that sex doesn't exist, we needed a new word. That magic word is transgender. Yep. And then the chapter goes into detail about the so-called gender identity industry, including such characters as John Stryker, the Arcus Foundation, and who I will call Martin Rothblatt. It contains a section on the sexual objectification of women, which says, the truth is that the pitiful ways in which women are treated are all right out there in the open. They are evident in the ways in which men catcall us, the ways in which we're depicted in imagery throughout society, the ways in which we're sexually harassed and abused, the ways in which we're objectified and in pornography. Gender identity does not erase any of it. In fact, gender identity makes the objectification of women much, much worse because objectification of women is the essence of what gender identity is. Sexual objectification of women is not new and feminists have been fighting it for centuries. What is relatively new is the evolution of the view that women exist solely for sexual and reproductive purposes into the notion that woman isn't a meaningful category of human beings at all, but rather a concept, a figment of a man's imagination. If anyone can be a woman, then no one is a woman. And if a man can claim to exist as a woman by simply announcing that he is one, that is a complete mockery of womanhood. The very concept of transgender woman is the ultimate expression of the denial of women's humanity. The simple truth is that women are female and men are male. The gender identity industry is working hard to obscure that truth in furtherance of its goal of abolishing sex. Don't let them get away with it. And then from the conclusion, the global campaign to protect women's sex-based rights. It is my hope that readers of this book will embrace this seriousness of this issue and join the global campaign to protect our hot, hard fought rights as women in the face of this pernicious assault. Pernicious because it poses as a movement of liberation and indeed as an extension of the movement to liberate women. WDI USA sees clearly that all of these efforts to abolish sex throughout law and society are having a devastating impact on women and girls and we, and we will not stop fighting them. We will never give up and we hope that you will join us. If you want to get involved in the fight against the abolition of sex, please sign the declaration on women's sex-based rights. All of humanity depends on it. Great, so Karen, that's, that's, it. that's really interesting. <clears throat> I've got some good, really good questions in the chat and I hope more people will put them in. I'll be calling on people later to ask those questions that they've put in the chat. Uh, but first, I'd like to make a, a point of asking. Um, you said right at the start that <clears throat> a publisher asked you to to uh, put together a book. Uh, so it, it was something that they came to you to ask you to do, rather than you having a thought of doing it anyway and having to take it round to 
Right. So, so you didn't have any pushback, or they didn't have any pushback from their uh, employees. That's fantastic. None. Because and in fact, when I submitted the draft manuscript, I waited in complete in, in a complete state of anxiety, worried that it would come back telling me that I had to use wrong sex pronouns. But it, the publisher did not do that. At no point did he tell me to compromise on language. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's really great. And for those of you who haven't actually seen the book before, this is this is my copy. It's not a thick book. It doesn't take you long, in fact, to read it. But all the the nitty gritty is is really there already, uh, um, Cara. Um, it, you talked about what do you say to people? You're bound to know people who themselves have a child who identifies as being transgender or the opposite sex, um, which of course they can never change sex. And that's a really interesting uh, thing that, you know, how do you deal with people that you know are only sticking up for this notion because they have been affected in their own families by transgenderism? I think that the question of children is a very specific one. When we're, when we're talking about minors, it's very difficult. And I am not a parent myself, and I'm not about to tell anyone how to parent their child. I, I mean it when I say that the parents I speak with who are grappling with this, and I know you all know this is true, these parents are in complete agony dealing with what is happening with their children. And um, so I don't think it's for me to say what should happen with respect to minors who are going through this. With respect to other friends and family members, it's very difficult. I mean, I have, I, 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 I am dealing with this in my family. I have a family member uh, who claims to be the opposite sex, and it's very challenging. And the way in which my family has decided to deal with it is simply to not talk about it, uh, which brings its own challenges. So it's hard. But what I end up saying in the book is that. I think that there is one set of people who call themselves transgender who are just lying, right? These are the male autogonophiles who are just sexually aroused at the thought of themselves as women. They know they're men and they're just lying. But there is a set, a set of people who sincerely believe that they are the opposite sex. And that has got to be a really devastating situation to have to grapple with. And I talk in the book about how when I was 18, I was anorexic. And I, I view this as very similar in the sense that it's confusion about one's body. I sincerely thought when I was 18 years old that I was obese and I starved myself as a result. And that caused some pretty severe medical problems. My parents, thankfully had compassion and they got me the help that I needed to resolve my confusion about my body. And I think that that's true with regard to the people who have a sincere belief that they're the opposite sex. I have tremendous sympathy for people who are that confused and I want them to get the help that they need to resolve that confusion. I see. I think that's the best thing that you can do really. And uh, a signposting to the organizations like uh, our duty or parents with inconvenient truths, um, the Bayswater group, all those uh, groups that we've got here and in, in the States and around the world now, of course, uh, will be able to help people and just provide a, a focus where they can talk about some of the real problems that they're having. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I was, it was interesting to hear uh, you talking about looking at uh, a posting in 2014 looking back to, 20, to 1973, um, when a woman was calling out the then fairly novel, a fairly rare invasion of womanhood by men. Uh, you know, it, it, it makes you think really how long this stuff has been going on, only by a few people, but massively, exponentially growing in the last 10 years, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Excuse me. I know we're going to be talking about my next book a little bit later, but I will just say now for for my next book, I did some research and I looked into what 
a lot of the American sexologists, as they're called, were doing mostly in the 1960s, I guess 50s going into the 60s and into the 70s. And th they were just conducting horrible experiments on people, really. Yeah. You know, Helen Joyce talks in her book about what was going on in Europe. I think she goes back to the 1940s and 50s, where it seemed that doctors thought sincerely, it seems that doctors thought sincerely that they could change a person into the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Helen describes this as being sort of unclear as to whether they sincerely thought that or whether they were just pushing the idea. But it seems clear that at least by the 1960s, the, the men in the States who were engaging in these experiments knew that people couldn't change sex. They were just conducting experiments on people. It's it's almost, uh, it, well, it is horrifying, isn't it? To think of people doing this, to find out what happens with with no thought for the impact on the the victims who are who who were obviously mentally ill, um, and uh, it, it it and really alerts you to the dangers of what happens if you let experimenters get on with it. Um, we we've, we've got some questions already. Uh, Una Jane um uh, made a, a point early uh, right early on about Elon Musk, um who now runs Twitter and has opened things up. Una Jane, do you want to make your point? Well, I just wrote in the comments that Elon Musk has in fact allowed Kelly J. Keane and Graham Lenahan and Megan Murphy and uh, actually a phalanx of uh, gender critical campaigners back onto Twitter, which has helped enormously to um, try and push back against the wall. And thank you, Cara. I've bought your book. I'm totally with you. I'm signed <laughs> every single petition that there is. I can't give you money because I'm afraid I'm funding European movements on this. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. To, to what extent, Cara, do you think that Elon Musk's uh, takeover of what's now called X, don't know why, um, will, will have made a difference to how the discourse is being able to maintain I, I think, as Una said, it, it's already made a tremendous difference, and I'm really happy about it. So much of the conversation has shifted because people are able to talk openly about these things in X, whatever we want to call it, which, yeah. you know, wh whatever anyone thinks about it has become an aspect of the public square. So I think that that's absolutely vital. I think that uh, X Twitter, <laughs> X Twitter, is probably a little bit more liberal in this respect uh, of being open and able to say things more so than Facebook, which seems to have quite severe community standards that you can be reported and kicked off of Facebook if you transgress the their their um, very gender related uh, standards. Um, and you're and you're on Facebook. You're on Facebook too, right? I have have a private Facebook that is friends only and I don't uh, much talk about sex and gender there. I talk about silly things like cats and lasagna. Um, but I yeah. do have a public Facebook profile where I yeah. post things on my Substack and I I I say all sorts of things on Facebook. I I'm somewhat mystified that neither platform has ever gone after me for anything with one exception which is that during the 2020 Olympics, I called Laurel Hubbard, the New Zealand weightlifter, male who competed in the women's weightlifting competition. I, I called him a man and they gave, Twitter gave me a 12 hour suspension and then let me back on, but that's it. Otherwise I say all sorts of completely outrageous things on social media and I've never faced any consequences for it. So I don't know. <laughs> Do you mean outrageous as in true? <laughs> yeah. Factual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is another thing that you, you're talking about as well, re very much here and also on, on the media when I've seen you um, being interviewed, <clears throat> about the importance of language, the, the sort of 1984-ness of the requirement to use Newspeak. Do you want to say a little bit yeah. more? Yeah. So, I mean, here's an interesting anecdote that I like to share, which is that several years ago, I was invited to join a meeting of a conservative women's group in a 
pretty major U.S. city. I don't need to say where, but it was a conservative women's group. And even though I'm not a political conservative, I was happy to join them. And one of the women said, Kara, what are we going to do about the topic of transgender athletes competing in women's sports? And I paused and I said, OK, well, we can talk about that. But before we talk about that, can I just ask you, what do you mean by transgender athletes? And the, the room immediately went silent and very tense and no one said anything. And I asked her, when you say transgender athletes, do you mean men and boys? And she looked at me and she said, I didn't think we were allowed to say that. And I sort of gave her permission to say that. And the, and the, the feeling in the room just shifted and the, the sense of relief was palpable and overwhelming. And what really struck me about that is that this is a conservative women's group. This was not a bunch of, you know, um, well, it, it wasn't a bunch of, you know, card carrying Democrats or something. And this woman felt so culturally and socially compelled to deny the material reality of sex that she didn't think she was allowed in her words to name it. And that just really struck me. So we really can do this. We really can just be completely candid and forthcoming with the language that we use when talking about matters of sex and gender. Now, that is not universally true, of course. Um, I was recently invited to participate in an event in Canada where a bunch of women were standing up doing a Kelly J-like event in Ottawa. And at first I accepted the invitation because I was happy to do it. But then I had to say no, because uh, as, as some people may know, when I know Allison wants to, wants to raise, uh, this coming weekend is the WDI USA convention in San Francisco. And the reason I had to decline the invitation from the Canadian women is that I thought that there was a very realistic possibility that I might be arrested in Canada for saying that men aren't women. And ordinarily, I would not even mind that. I would be perfectly happy to get arrested for speaking the truth. But I didn't think that I wanted to put the WDI USA convention at risk by being in a Canadian jail while it was going on. So I said no. So I say all that to say that I, I don't think that I can be arrested in the US for saying that men are male and women are female, but I am very aware that women and men in other countries are at much greater risk of facing very serious consequences for speaking the truth. And I am watching that situation closely. Yeah, we have had a number of uh, law cases uh, which keep racking up. Um, and th there's one on at the moment that's gonna be uh, concluded at the beginning of October. That's Dr. Shahra Ali, former deputy chairman of the Green Party, who is uh, taking a case against his own party because of their conduct, you know, their, their discriminatory conduct. And there's lots of uh, other aspects. We have one in our party, uh, a, a colleague who's taking the, our party to court. Um, and these tend to be found in favor of the women, mostly women, but Shahra, of course, is a man, uh, who are, who's, who's right to speak openly is being stopped in contravention of the European Convention on Human Rights, that we have this right to speak freely, uh, reasonably, but freely, um, about these sort of issues which are you know, protected. Um, and also we have this, uh, this protection in the Our Equality Act. Um, so it, it, we, we, we feel as though we're making, we're making uh, certain steps, we're, we're progressing here, how do you feel about that in, in America? Do you feel that there's progress being made? So there's no question that we're still quite far behind Turf Island in terms of progress being made. Um, but also there, there's a lot of progress that's invisible. And by that, I mean, for example, we've got something called the Equality Act, which is not like your Equality Act. Uh, the uh, our version of the Equality Act would be absolutely devastating for women and girls because it would completely redefine the word sex in a way that that would obliterate sex out of existence for all purposes under U.S. civil rights law. So the Equality Act is terrible 
for women and girls. And it's been around since 2015. 2015, it's been around for eight years and it hasn't passed. Now, what I think is significant about that is that President Biden in campaigning for the presidency promised to get it passed within 100 days of taking office. And in February, 2021, it passed in the House of Representatives. It very quickly went to the Senate. It got a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee in March of 2021, and it passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. We've got a guy in our Senate called Charles Schumer. Most people in the world, including the vast majority of Americans, have never heard of him. But he's the majority leader of the U.S. Senate, making him, I would argue, the most powerful person in the U.S. government. And he had the authority as of March 2021 to bring this bill to the floor of the Senate for a vote. And not only did he not do it during the first 100 days of Biden's presidency, he didn't do it for the first two years of <laughs> Biden's presidency. And by the end of 2022, the bill appeared to be dead. Now, we can talk about where the bill stands now if you want. But, um, but my point there is that if, if the Democrats really wanted to push this through the Senate, they could do it. They have a majority in the United States Senate. They didn't do it, even though in late 2022, they did pass marriage equality through the Senate. So my point there is just to say, I think we're making a lot of progress behind the scenes, no matter what President Biden might ramble about in his State of the Union addresses or anywhere else. I don't think that abolishing sex has the support of many of, of Democrats in power, as much as they talk about it on Twitter and elsewhere, I don't think it has as much support as many of us might think from a from a cursory look at things. If you look behind the scenes, we're making a lot more progress than is obvious. So, so underneath the the public face of the the government, and of course, the executive orders have had tremendous impacts on women's rights and and sports and Title Nine. Um, but uh, uh, apart from that the the progress of the Equality Act has been stalled, hasn't it? it the, the bill, uh, it hasn't yet been enacted. And do you think it will ever be enacted? So I, I as a rule, I don't make New Year's resolutions, but I made a New Year's resolution for 2023 to say that I will not make predictions this year because when I make predictions, I am almost always wrong. So I don't wanna make a prediction about what's going to happen with the Equality Act. I will say, though, that um, it appeared to be dead in at the end of 2022, and the U.S. chapter of WDI wrote a long thing about why we thought it was dead. And in that long thing that we wrote, we said we were not out of the woods yet because the Democrats could bring it back in 2023. And we said we did not think that would happen because... When the president promised to get it passed within 100 days of taking office, and he failed to do that, and then he failed to get it passed in 2021, and then he failed to get it passed in 2022, that should have been a massive embarrassment, especially when the most powerful person in the United States government is a member of his own party. That It should have happened, and it didn't. And the president should be very embarrassed about it. And we thought that the Democrats in power would not want to embarrass the president again. We didn't think they would be that stupid. It turns out we were wrong. They are that stupid and they have brought it back in 2023, but it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just sitting there and uh, the Republicans in the house aren't gonna take action on it. And I don't think there's appetite for it on the Senate side either as demonstrated by the president's failure to get it passed at all in his presidency. So I'm cautiously optimistic that it won't go anywhere. Very cautiously. Excellent. In, in your book, you do refer to polling that says that most Americans are against men invading women's sports. Do you think that that, that may be why they haven't pushed it because they can see the way that, that the polling is going and uh, it's not in their interests? And the polling is even more so in 2023 than it was in 2021. Increasingly, Americans across the political spectrum have had it with this complete denial of the material reality of sex. And regardless of what the Democrats might say publicly, they know it. It will be really interesting heading into 2024, where we have 
congressional elections and of course the 2024 presidential election will happen. It'll be really interesting to see. I wonder whether there's any uh, way that you could, by analogy, you could compare this bill with the question of uh, women's right to abortion, that it was held Roe versus Wade and, and it was a Supreme Court decision and it wasn't actually enacted in the way that they should have done, maybe, to make it a federal thing, that it, it was a provision for the whole of, of America. And that, that the Democrats kept that up, um, kind of to shore up their support with the electorate. Is, is it, might it be the same sort of phenomenon? I think that that question is very complicated. President Obama said publicly on the record that codifying Roe v. Wade in U.S. law was not a priority of his administration. He said that in 2009. The Democrats could have codified Roe v. Wade in U.S. law at any point since 1973, and, and they just didn't do it. Now we have this really troubling phenomenon. I don't know if you have it over there, but it's really vicious. It it Part of the, the more recent push with this movement to abolish sex is to combine advocacy for gender identity with advocacy for abortion um, and framing both as matters of bodily autonomy. Yeah. And in my view, it's really, really bad because states that want to secure abortion rights, which WDI USA completely supports, are starting to introduce bills that protect abortion rights, which is very good, but they also enshrine things like children's right to so-called gender affirming care under the rubric of bodily autonomy. And I just find this extremely troubling. It's it's really nasty. Yeah, uh, so the, there's some peril uh, uh, going around there as well. Um, I'm gonna ask Sue to tell us about the Economist uh, article. Sue, you mentioned it in chat. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this and we'll find it and we can circulate it to people afterwards. Okay, uh, right. So not at all. Um, I was actually struggling to scan it, but at the moment, I, my scanner won't talk to me. Right. Uh, well, they had a full page piece pointing out that ructions are starting in California. Car I know Cara, so uh, she may well have seen it already. But talking about a fight back coming in California in various school districts where different groups in different areas have become very concerned about all these generally trans-related things that are happening in schools um, remo uh, using the uh, new names without telling the parents and then saying, you know, we, w we absolutely won't tell the parents. Some things about toilets, the whole list. And so it's a full page, which means that, you know, the economists can pack an awful lot of information in um, and uh, lists some of the different groups, the different areas where are these where these campaigns are going on, you know, and saying the Democrats are starting the fight back against the fight back with a little bit of information. But I mean, you know, basically, generally, it's cheering stuff to hear. And so have a look at it, folks. It, it would have come out last Thursday, this edition. And I and I defer totally to Cara anyway, because she I don't know, you probably gave them all the information for it. <laughs> <laughs> or some of it anyway. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Oh, well, it's true. It's true. Thank you, Sue. And it's true that uh some school districts in California are pushing back because parents are very upset about all of this. Parents are very upset about schools socially transitioning their children without their knowledge. And an even more recent development, I think it was yesterday, is uh, the UN Special Rapporteur, I think you, you say it, Reem al Salem. I don't know how to pronounce it, but she put out a statement about California laws on child custody, which I just found astonishing. I was not aware of a UN Special Rapporteur weighing in on a matter of US state law ever. I mean, the fact that I'm not aware of it doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but I'm not, I'm just, I've never seen that happen. And she didn't specifically reference, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't give you context. California recently passed a law that said that judges in making child custody determinations 
have to take into account a parent's view of child transition. And the strong implication is that a judge making a custody determination is supposed to favor a parent who supports affirmation over a parent who doesn't. And it's just, it's devastating to parents and kids. And in her statement, she did not refer specifically to that law, but she did speak out about California's child custody laws, which I just thought was an astonishing development. I was amazed and so happy to see it. Yeah, that, that's part of the problem. Uh, uh, Sue's just referred to the fact that the United States is one of the few countries in the world that has not signed up, well, ratified the CEDAW, the Convention Against All, uh, 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 the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And that's a real problem, I think, because you haven't done that, or indeed the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, do you want to say something? Now we're on the topic. Do you want to say something about that and the Women's Declaration? Maybe? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrendous that the United States hasn't ratified these conventions. It's just awful. I know that Una's asking for a reference to the comment by uh, by Reem al Salam, I, I, it was on Twitter. That's all I remember. But it was it was just yesterday, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. And it's her her tweet was in reference to a custody law concerning uh, the it's horrible the the murder of a young boy by his father after a judge had given custody to the father. And I don't know the I don't know the the details of that law because it's not about sex and gender. But then after she tweeted that, she had a subtweet that kind of hinted that she was also paying very close attention to this other law that does concern sex and gender. You should be able to find it on X, excuse me. Yeah, her Twitter handle is uh, at U-N-S-R-V-A-W. If people want to find her, you can find her at, I'll say that again, at capital U-N-S-R-V-A-W. And so uh, you'll be able to find that. Okay, um, let's ask Caroline, please, to ask your question. Very interesting point that you raised early on, Caroline. Uh, are you ready? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, hi, Cara. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is, are things like the interim cash review cutting through at all to US Democrats? And my second question is, is it possible to defeat gender ideology in the US without working with those who would completely roll back LGB rights? So as for the first question, uh, <laughs> So jumping ahead a little bit, my second book is going to be called The Reckoning, How the Democrats Betrayed Women and Girls. And it should come out later this fall. And the reason I say that now is to say that I will be talking about all of that. The afterword of the book, well, most of the book is making the case that the Democrats know exactly what they're doing. Uh, I have people tell me occasionally that, oh, you know, maybe Biden just has bad advisors and maybe he just you know, is too old to know what he's doing. No, absolutely not. President Biden is very close friends with a man named Sarah McBride. And that's all I'll say about that. But um, the Democrats know exactly what they're doing. And part of the reason I know they know exactly what they're doing is that I and other women, Democrats, radical feminists in the United States have been telling them since 2016. And I can make the case with receipts that they know exactly what they're doing. And so the afterword of the book, is called A Cautionary Tale and a Policy Prescription. And the cautionary tale is going to lay out essentially the story of Turf Island and, and what's happening over there. And I'm just going to say, you know, to the Democrats, watch what's happening over there because the same thing's going to happen to you. And it will include information about the cast report. It will include information about Tavistock. I pay way more attention to what goes on on Turf Island than I ever thought I would, um, but I do. So, so that's the answer to that. As to the other question about, you know, working with those who would roll back LGB. I mean, this is a, this is a really difficult question about working with 
conservatives everywhere. And what that means, you know, is Republicans and conservative groups here in the states. So what WDI USA has decided to do about that is to work with conservative groups when it's strategic to do so. And by that, we mean there are sometimes very good reasons to do that. And I, I also have questions about what it means to work with. So for example, I have made contacts over the years with people with whom I disagree on all sorts of things. I disagree with these people on abortion. I disagree with these people on the rights of same-sex attracted people. And they know that, and they don't try to change my mind. But some of these people are really connected with, for example, staffers in the United States Congress, really connected with members of the federal judiciary. And if I can use those connections to get access to power, I, I'm gonna use those connections to get access to power. Um, and and then when it's not strategic, then then no, like we wouldn't work with anyone on the political right if it's not strategic to do so. Fair, fair, and and, and in some cases uh, that they're, they're the only ones who are listening. You know, uh, you've got to work with people who are prepared to listen. Yeah, and I guess I would also just say there are many ways in which, even though it's almost entirely only U.S. Republicans that are pushing back on the gender identity agenda, quite often they get it wrong, in my view, in the sense that they use the language of the gender ideologues frequently. And I don't, I don't like that. I want them to use very clear, accurate, sex-specific language. And to the extent that I have built trusting relationships among people on the political right, and I can say, look, knock it off, stop using this language, use clear, accurate, sex-based language, they've listened to me and they've shifted. And I think that that's a good thing. And uh, just another thing, and this might be very specific to American politics, I don't know, but for several years, the conservatives who were pushing back against gender identity were leading their arguments with religious freedom arguments. They were saying, for example, I have a religious freedom right not to believe in gender identity. And that's of course true. Every, everyone has a religious freedom right to believe whatever they want to believe here. And that's true, but that's not going to be a winning argument that's going to persuade liberals. We need to be leading with feminist arguments. We need to be leading with LGBT arguments. We need to be leading with speech arguments. And some of us have been able to persuade some of the conservative groups to walk back some of their focus on religious liberty, which I think is a good thing. And then the last thing I'll just say on it is I've gotten a lot of pushback for going on Tucker Carlson and I understand why, but the first time I did it was 2017. And Tucker Carlson, before he left Fox News, would on average get 4 million views uh, every episode. And after I went on the first time, the, I was at the time I was on the board of the Women's Liberation Front and the website of the Women's Liberation Front completely crashed that night because four million people were exposed to the radical feminist critique of gender identity. If we have the, the media platforms to expose people to the radical feminist critique of gender identity, we need to be using them. And that's why I'm not apologizing for going on to Tucker Carlson. No, I think you're right not to do so because uh, never complain, never explain. Is that right? <laughs> like the ball bonds. <laughs> um, look, Jane, I'm hoping you'll ask your question now. Jane's iPad, you have a Hi. question. Hello. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Hello. Hi, um, I, I'd like to ask you what women in the UK can do to help it, um, what's happening in the US. Gosh, that's a really good question. I don't have an immediate answer, but let me give some thought to it. Um, well, I mean, so this question that 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 we were just talking about about working with the right, you know, I we those of us who are on the political left who work strategically with conservative organizations get a lot of criticism for it from our own shores and also from Turf Island. So to the extent that you can support those of us who are working very hard to get rid of gender identity and to protect the sex-based rights of women and girls by amplifying the leftist feminist critique of gender identity, 
we could really use the support. So I guess that's my only immediate answer, but I'll give it some more thought. Thank you for that. Actually, that fits in with why I asked it. We we went to the States uh, earlier in the year and stayed with a relative who worked through university. So we spent an evening with uh, her friends from this university. And nobody, I, I talked to quite a few of them about this stuff. Nobody was, nobody had a clue actually, really. And there was such a big divide about, you know, big, these left-leaning people who just were either not interested on or trying not to be interested. I think that's changing as well. So for example, uh, I recently visited family and my mother told me that she goes on a weekly hike with a friend of hers and she invited me to go on the hike with her. And on the way in the car, my mother, you know, I mentioned that my family doesn't really talk about this topic. My mother said, okay, just so you know, my friend asks a lot of questions and she'll be very curious about what you do. And I said, well, mom, that's fine. But if she asks me questions about what I do, I can't very well evade the topic. And she said, I know it's fine. Go ahead and talk about it. And so I did with this woman, this very progressive lefty feminist, anti-capitalist, socialist woman was very open and we had a very candid conversation. She was like, thank you so much for saying these things. I'm on the left and I'm scared to talk about it because you know, of all the reasons we all know, but she said, what you're saying just makes so much sense. I was like, cool, great. Thanks for having the conversation. So I really do think things are shifting. Yeah. Uh, Lou, who's just left us, otherwise uh, I, 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 she'll be able to hear what I'm saying. She had made some comments actually in the in the chat um, to sign up to the uh, mailing list. So I sign up either to the U USA WDI mailing list to stay up to date with actions and events um, and buy some merch. But also, um, if you haven't uh, signed up to the Women's Declaration International here at home in UK, those of you who are British, and there are country contacts in just about every country, including Afghanistan now, which I think is a big, a big relief. Um, then uh, go on, go to the WDI website, which is womensdeclaration.com, and uh, and uh, have a look at what's there. Once you've signed up, you'll be invited to take part in feminist question time. And Cara is a uh, I wouldn't say a regular, but frequent <laughs> speaker on feminist question time, uh, where women from all over the world um, update us all on what's currently an issue in countries that you might not hear of on mainstream media. So it's a really fascinating opportunity to find out what's really happening that the media, as in your book you tell us, aren't prepared to tell us about. Okay, after that short advert for um, w, WDI um, Feminist Question Time, let's move on. Uh, you've been writing this new book, uh, The Reckoning, can you give us a bit more of an idea about what it's going to be about? And, and uh, I, I want to look at the picture on the back that you um, promised us earlier. Not the picture, the, okay. the text. So the, the manuscript is currently with the publisher. I submitted what I view as a near final draft in August, and I'm expecting edits back any day now. I have no way of knowing when, but they'll send me edits and it should come out sometime in the fall. And I thought I might read the text of the back cover, which is final. Should I do that? I wish you would. Okay. So this is the approved text of the back cover. In The Reckoning, Kara Dansky, a radical feminist and lifelong Democrat, exposes the invasion of men into female-only spaces, the harming of children, and the silencing, punishment, cancellation, and even violence against women who speak out. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party, which claims to represent the interests of women, ignores the problem, while its allies in the organized left and mainstream media paint all opposition to the trans agenda as right-wing. But radical feminists are not right-wing. They are leftists who know that sex is real and are not afraid to demand women's hard-won rights to safe spaces and privacy. The Democrat left-wing establishment knows all the ways in which gender identity harms women and girls and plenty of boys. 
yet they are sacrificing women and children to a vicious profit-driven industry that allows men to invade women's spaces and sports, denies that sex is real, and slices up children's bodies. Now the Democrats are facing a reckoning. Detransitioners are starting to speak out, clinicians are blowing the whistle, and women and girls, including many lesbians, have had it. Even now, the tide of common sense and decency is starting to turn in other countries that have banned harmful medical and surgical procedures for underage children, and a handful of Democrats are bucking the trend at the state level. Elected Democrats will later claim they didn't know, that they couldn't have known, that the science has changed, but they knew. They have known all along. This book provides the evidence. So that's the back cover of the new book. Um, it's still subject to change, but it's final as far as I know. And yeah, I mean, I just, it it starts with uh, a, a candid conversation that I'm trying to have with American liberal and progressive women in particular. And it explains all of these problems. It talks about Kelly J. It talks about the violence that women experience all over the world. It talks about Australia. It talks about New Zealand. And now I'm going to have to add the Netherlands to the list of, of places where women have faced violence for speaking out. Um, it, it, it brings American liberal and progressive women's attention to the problem. And uh, then I make the case that the Democrats have known about this, providing all the receipts. And then I go into organizations like the ACLU, the Human Rights Campaign, GLAAD, Planned Parenthood, National Organization for Women, Women's March, all of the lefty, you know, so-called pro-feminist organizations on the left that are completely captured by an ideology that hates women and girls. And I just expose all of that. I talk a little bit about the emergence of queer theory in the in the academy. And um, I talk about the influence of the Yogyakarta principles internationally and on the Biden administration. And then it goes into talking about the, the actual real life impacts of this ideology on the lives of women and girls. I talk about women's sports, women's prisons, lesbian only spaces. I talk about the unique impacts suffered by black women by gender ideology. Uh, provided mainly by the Black Women's Caucus of the WDI USA chapter. Um, and I talk about the harms to women and young people in, in very clear language. I don't mince words. I use the, the words of the detransitioners who have been testifying uh, at the state level and at the federal level. And uh, I talk about the industry itself. I talk about the, the money behind it. I talk about big pharma. It, it's just... It, I hope to expose as much of this as possible. And I I have a concern, which is I'm not gonna be able to cover everything. I, I just, I can't, I can't cover everything. And people are gonna be mad at me because I missed this, that, or the other thing. And I already know that, but I'm doing my best. You know, Jane, has that, that's, that's a really great summing up. I can't wait for your book to come out. I hope you're gonna make sure that we have plenty of publicity for it. Um, uh, Una Jane has just uh, passed a comment about Chloe Cole. Una Jane, would you like to say something? Well, I'm sure Cara knows exactly uh, how pertinent this uh, young lady is. She has managed to uh, light up a rebellion in uh, Democrats, I hope, to um, uh, open their eyes to the nonsense that they have and the terrible harms to these two, these young women. American detransitioned young women have suffered horrendous harm at the, at the hands of the, I'm sorry, but it's a commercial um, health uh, service, a uh, medical service. It, it just, uh, it, they'll take the dollars and they don't care. That's it, they don't care. Yeah. They don't care. That's exactly right. For anyone who doesn't know, Chloe uh, went on testosterone at the age of 13. She had a double mastectomy at the age of 15. And she states very openly that her doctors and therapists completely bullied her parents into going along with it. They told her parents that if she didn't go through these procedures, she would kill herself. And so the parents consented, as far as I know. And at 16, she started to question everything. And She's 19 today. She had a birthday, I think, two months ago or something. 
And she now fully accepts herself as female and she's been testifying all over the country. She's absolutely amazing. She's totally brilliant. She's completely phenomenal. And she's suing uh, the medical entities that did this to her. Can I ask which medical entity? I hope it's United Health or one of the biggest organizations. It's Kaiser. Oh, right. That's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. And has she got a crowdfunder? Even we've heard of them. Yeah. Has she got a crowdfunder? <laughs> I don't I don't know. And I don't know who's representing her either. Okay. I think we need to explore that a little bit more. I, I have heard of her, but I didn't know that she was actually suing somebody. Chloe Cole. Thanks, Ian and Jane, for bringing her to our attention. Uh, we have a fair number of detransitioners in this country, too, who are doing sterling work. And, uh, we, you know, we've got to give them a, a real a pat on the back and all our support because they have been victims of the ideology. And I know some people uh, say, well, it's their own fault. They made their own decision. And people make the stupid decisions when they're kids. You know, they might have a, a tattoo uh, that's, that they later want to get to get rid of or cover up. It's easier to cover up a tattoo than some you know, amputations to part of your body. But these are the sort of things that children do, uh, young people do do. And uh, you know, we, we do need to support them. I think there's a detransitioners advisory network, which, uh, which is working with and for detransitioners. Um, we also have a group of, uh, of trans widows, we call them, in the UK. Do you have a network in the United States for, the, uh, for trans widows? I don't know if there's a network. Um, I know that I've spoken with plenty of women who are trans widows, and I think they're connected with the UK women as well, at least informally. Right, right. Um, uh, we, we are going to have a couple of uh, a trans widow and a child of a, tr a transitioner talking to us, I think, in December. So that's uh, that's another uh, pair of people to, to look forward to. But th there are a lot of... Uh, facets of, of this phenomenon, political transgenderism, which we are all uh, tangentially touched by, whether we're the children of, a spouse of a late transitioning man. Um, <clears throat> very rare that it's a husband of a late transitioning woman. They don't tend to stick around. Um, but uh, all these aspects, and of course the parents of children who have been inculcated into the cold and taken over by it. Um, and there are lots of forms of resistance. Ah, Una Jane, would you like to say something about uh, about this? Uh, not that much, except to say uh, that this is going to be uh, an emerging theme in the feminist pushback. And I hope that you'll hear a variety of different trans widows some interested in the emotional side, the therapy, others interested in perhaps a more scientific position and a legal position. Because after all, at the end of the day, we're left looking after the children of these extremely disturbed men. And we have to be certain that we are legally competent in every domain. That means, I'm afraid, being sure that you haven't lost your emotional, your strength inside you. You have to be competent. Yeah, that must take a real struggle, really, to uh, to be able to navigate all of that and keep your inner core uh, strong enough to deal with all the, the buffeting that, uh, that take place. Thank you very much for that, Yuna Jane. Um, I'll come back to you about this. We've also had a comment in the, in the chat about... Uh, Women's Rights Network, which, um, thank you. Um, Women's Rights Network is a growing movement here in the UK. Can't recommend them enough. Uh, we, we, I know that we've got some WRN members here tonight. <clears throat> we usually have a, a, a few, at least, that I know of. And uh, I don't know if anybody wants to make any comments about that. But uh, I'd like to ask you, Cara, um, whether you have a, a similar sort of phenomenon in, a, in the United States, uh, the WRN is kind of a, a groups locally based, but network together across the country. 
How, how does that work for you? So we have the WDI chapter and yeah. Women's Liberation Front. And then we've got smaller groups, like something called Turf Collective. I don't know if you've heard of Turf Collective, um, but that was founded by a woman named Jessica Gonzalez. Um, we're all very informally connected, but there's no formal network like WRN like that. Um, I don't have a good reason as to why, other than I just don't know that anyone has time to organize it because we're all just so busy doing what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. But I think we're so closely we're so closely connected informally anyway that if if I need to communicate with Women's Liberation Front at all, I yeah. send a message to the chair. I mean, it's, yes, we, I mean, we I, talk almost every day. I think the difference between us and you is that we are relatively small, and we can actually have a network, you know, across our country. Uh, which is, uh, you know, you, you can actually get places, whereas getting any place in America often takes a lo long hops and uh, quite big, quite substantial journeys. Oh, uh, hang on, there's a comment here. Um, Claire, do you want to say something, your last comment? Um, yeah, I can do. Uh, we're a set of um, local women. We're organised in, in regional groups, county or in in London and some of the other big cities uh, in boroughs and we kind of operate a, spub, a hub and spoke model so we've got like a central core team um, with a website and, and we kind of organize center WRM wide um, events from that that core team but each of the local groups are pretty autonomous and they get on and do things that are relevant to their local area so it, it's quite powerful, really. And I think we've picked up quite a head of steam. Eh? But we've only been going for a couple of years. We've got about 2,000 members, about 6,500 followers. Um, and, yeah, we, we, you know, we've come to um, national press attention a few times and <laughs> so on. So, yeah, making we are making a difference. Yeah, very much so. A, a, a number of women from the Thames Valley Network um, had an action in uh, Henley, just at uh, the uh, regatta. And I think uh, just before they changed the um, the rules about who could compete and uh, keeping the women's category for women only, which I think was a, a real success. Thanks for that, Claire. That's great. And we've got branches all over the country, haven't we? Yeah, and we have uh, special interest groups. So the sports special interest group in particular has been very, uh, very effective. There's yeah, been indeed. work on there, of course, but... Yeah, and the Scottish Feminist Network have been around for over two years fighting our government nonsense. Maria, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the Scottish Feminist Network? Hello, where are you, McLaughlin? Hello? No, um, the Scottish Feminist Network. Yeah, that's, um, that's what you've just been saying now about Okay, that's fine, not on audio. No, no worries. Um, what I'd like to ask you now about, uh, uh, Cara, is um, a development which neither of us know much about because we're not from that country, but in Canada, uh, I think a lot of us will know of Coach Blade, Linda Blade, who was a, a, an Olympian herself and has been a, a high level uh, administrator for sports in Canada. And she related a huge victory at the C Canadian Conservative Party Convention. And this was in support of women's sex-based rights. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has heard about this, but it looked as though there was a huge support in the convention hall for a motion, a commitment to, to rolling back the, the, the tide in Canada uh, and uh, restoring uh, women's sex-based rights. And does this all hold any portents for the United States, do you think? Just broad brush. I know you can't speak in great detail. Yeah, I I don't know anything more about what happened other than what you just reported, Alison, um, about what happened in Canada. We have something called the Women's Bill of Rights in the States, which is a very simple, straightforward model piece of legislation that can be incorporated at the federal level or at any state level. And it's been introduced in the House of Representatives 
And I believe it is in effect in three states at this point, maybe four, but it's a very simple, straightforward, I think it's one page piece of legislation that basically defines the words sex, woman, women, girl, boy, et cetera, and defines them in unambiguous terms. And so any legislator anywhere in the states can introduce it at either the state or federal level. And that's gaining some steam. So I'm quite happy to report about that. Oh, that sounds really interesting. And uh, that sounds as though it's got the capacity to, to expand tremendously. Yeah. That's um, the hope. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, what I want to ask you again, another couple of questions, um, if I can, um, are about, yeah, uh, you you said on your substack, no, it might have been on your on your website. I want to read out a, a passage that's uh, tremendously strong. Uh, globally for thousands of years, and in this country for hundreds of years now, women and girls have been discriminated, discriminated against in and excluded from civil society, all aspects of it, specifically on the basis of sex. All of the men making all of the laws for all of that time knew exactly what the word sex meant, and they deliberately kept us out because we are women and girls. And now, with the redefinition of sex to include gender identity, we are supposed to pretend that none of that exists. Women are standing up. We are not having it. Now, I, you know, I, I found that thrilling uh, statement of, uh, of, you know, where here I stand, a sort of Martin Luther moment. And can you tell us a bit more about the, uh, the what, where you were when you said this? I think I said that during a talk I gave at the Seattle Public Library in February 2020, at which time I was on the board of Women's Liberation Front. The speakers at that event were Lear Keith, the founder of Women's Liberation Front, Megan Murphy from Feminist Current, myself, and a woman named Saba Malik, who is a very close friend of Women's Liberation Front and spoke very movingly about how inappropriate it is to compare our movement to protect women's sex-based rights with old school um, racial segregation in the States. But anyway, so so that was a very interesting event in that we, we booked the room at the Seattle Public Library and predictably there were many calls to cancel us. And the leadership of the library held several meetings at which they heard from members of our opposition who behaved predictably, just as we've all seen, and uh, you know, made absolutely nonsensical non-arguments about how we're a bunch of Nazi fascists. And our supporters very helpfully appeared at library meetings and made very sensible, rational arguments about why we should be heard. And to its great credit, the library went forward with the meeting we worked very cooperatively with library staff and especially library security. On the day of the event, there was a bomb threat at the library and they had to evacuate the library in order to make sure it was safe for members of the public as well as ourselves. And that evening, which is when the event happened, there was a mob of, I wanna say 300 or so people outside banging on the windows and yelling about how we were all turfs and all of the things. And some people managed to get inside and they tried to disrupt the event and women stood up and chanted, let women speak really loud. And the library could not have been better. They were so cooperative and helpful. And at the end of the event, the library security had to escort us out of the building and then hand us off to the Seattle Police Department who had to escort us to our car while people were just screaming expletives, you know, F word turfs, F word turfs. And once we reached the car, people were banging with their fists on the hood and the roof of the car, screaming and yelling at us. Anyway, it was a long evening, but uh, I'm very happy we had the event. And what you read, Allison, is one of the things I said in my talk. Yeah, and that's that summed up to me, uh, the sort of spirit of resistance. I don't want to I don't want to state it too strongly, but I think that the resistance by women here in America 
in Australia, New Zealand, obviously in the, in Utrecht, in the, in Holland uh, at the moment, and certainly from uh, what Sue's told us in the past in Germany, it's beginning to be articulated all over the place. And also the fact that uh, health services in other European countries, in Finland, in Sweden, in Denmark, as well as uh, UK, um, are beginning to question uh, how far they should go to indulge um, what's known as gender affirming care, health care, which really is uh, short for um, amputation and mutilation of body parts and, and uh, lifelong medicalization of young people. Um, but this is happening. And I think this is a really important step uh, that, that is being taken. And the fact that you're able to say this out loud, um, even though you have to face the sort of demonstration that you did at Seattle Public Library, um, is, is a, a really important um, move towards reality. Um, so England, yes, there's, um, and in New Zealand and Australia too. Yeah, I think uh, Kenny J is going back there shortly. And uh, on uh, part two of her letter to the uh, <laughs> the uh, Australasians. Um, but this is uh, this is a, a, another step forward. Now I'm looking to see if there is any more questions, any more chat. Uh, there's a uh, an advert for Sue England's uh, human rights law, global, European, and UK. I can only recommend that highly because I've, I've had two goes at this and uh, it's just waiting for her internet to get sorted before it starts again. But if anybody wants to sign up, the email address is there for you to, to sign up to. Now, um, we've moved on maybe a bit too quickly earlier because I was hoping to ask you questions um, really about, you, you mentioned things to do with the, the corruption of data and uh, the, the way that the media uh, falsely portray people as women when they're committing crimes. Is that carried through, as it has been here, into recording uh, criminal offences carried out by men who say they're women? It's very difficult to know because, you know, we're, we're basically 50 countries over here and we've got hundreds of thousands of law enforcement departments. So it's very difficult to know what individual law enforcement departments are doing. I just read literally today that the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin Police Department is has adopted a policy of not reporting what they refer to as the gender of a crime victim. But or ultimately, victim. victim. Right. Yeah, yeah, and the, the reasoning, they said that they had had conversations with the local LGBTQ plus groups. And evidently three men who claimed to be women had been murdered in Milwaukee recently, which is horrible. Uh, but it was reported that they reported the victims as men because See. they are. Yeah. And that caused, you know, miss anxiety over misgendering of crime victims <laughs> correct you said so so. Now, right so now they're not going to report the quote gender of a victim uh that's that's news to me as of today literally but ultimately law enforcement agencies in the states report crime statistics to the fbi which in turn reports them nationally according to sex and that has been true i haven't checked recently i think i last checked last year probably but i'll check it again but you know it's so interesting because president biden told everyone in 2021 that all federal agencies have to just ignore the reality of sex and redefine it to include gender identity but the last i checked the fbi hadn't done it when it came to reporting on crime incidents. Now, what we don't know, though, when the FBI reports this stuff, they have, you know, they'll have tables and it'll be like murder, manslaughter, robbery, assault. It'll go down the list of offenses and list them by sex, the numbers and the percentages according to sex. But 
all that is, is law enforcement agencies self-reports to the FBI. So in other words, we don't know how to evaluate the quality of that data, unfortunately. Right. So uh, presumably if they have a, a, a huge uptick in the number of females, number of women committing sexual offences, for instance, which is against the, the norm, I think it's certainly in our country, I, I suspect in your country too, certainly from what your, your book tells us, um, do you think they will investigate what that uptick means or will they start being more, you know, uh, uh, interrogative of women and uh, interrogating whether women are real women are actually committing these crimes? It's so hard to know, you know, it's so unpredictable. I, I feel like at least here, we're living at a time when things are changing so quickly. It's very difficult to know. It's very difficult to know what's going to happen next. You know, I part of why I feel so optimistic is because the other side is pushing back so hard. Um, so even though things are bad, I I just feel like we've made so much progress that the other side is kind of becoming unhinged. And it's very difficult to know how just how unhinged they're going to get and how responsive public agencies will be. It's it's just very difficult to predict to predict. Yeah. But once once uh, once these figures start coming in and, and building up, then the researchers in the various universities who crunch these numbers and produce the predictions. Uh, and presumably your, your census people too, they'll start asking. I mean, the whole, all the data is corrupted effectively. You know, the census, the crime stats, the, 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 the punishment uh, people sent to prison, even healthcare stats um, aren't able to be uh, treated as honest figures any longer. Will the academics start interrogating these or will they just gloss over the thing? I mean. I don't think you can ask. Oh, no. I yeah. I mean, I don't know. I what one would think that this kind of thing would get news coverage, right? This massive uptick in women committing sex offenses. One would think that would get media coverage, but nothing else has gotten media coverage. So I, I just don't know if it if it will. It's it's just impossible to say. Everything is so crazy when it comes to this stuff. It's hard to know just how crazy it can get. Yeah, I mean, it, it has ramifications for every aspect of our lives, isn't it? You know, um, obviously Title IX, which is to do with giving girls the same opportunities for sport and recreation that boys get, and also getting scholarships. Am, am I right? I mean, are there other things that we don't know about here? So Title IX prohibits sex discrimination throughout the entire educational arena. So most of us think of it as having to do primarily with women's sports. And it does have a lot to do with women's sports, but it prohibits sex discrimination throughout education in every US educational institution that receives money under Title IX, which is virtually all of them. Uh, so it includes a lot of different kinds of provisions, uh, including, for example, you know, policies about sexual harassment and sexual assault on college campuses. It has a wide range of things that it addresses in addition to sports. Right, I see. So uh, the, the, there's obviously going to be development there over over a period of time. Sue has a question. Um, fire away, will you, please? Sue. Yeah. Um, because of what you just said, that reminded me. You're talking about Biden giving instructions. But was it not last September that he had to tell everybody that the federal law that says all males in America have to sign up with what is unfortunately, I think, the SSS, is that the name of the office? Um, to be on a register so that they can be called up to the military in various forms. Am I... Am I misunderstanding something? But I, re I remember that Biden was forced by the military into making an announcement that you can't start saying you're a woman. The federal law says if you're born as a man, you have to register with this agency that then has all the details. So when they want you for something, 
uh, you're on this list. Is that right? Yeah, it's called the Selective Service, and all males have to register for it at the age of 18. And the Biden administration clarified at one point that, yes, that means all males, regardless of their self-described identity. Yes, all, all, all males have to register for the Selective Service, which has always been the case. And no women do. Yeah, and that's This tells us the, the United States government knows what sex is. You know, they know when it suits them. Because I, oh, sorry, okay, well, I've got that right then, because I think it was September last year, maybe you do have the exact date, because I was, I had that in my brain as the date that Twu Twans died. <laughs> you know, um, sorry, Biden squared up to the military, and Biden stepped back, and uh, in the US, you know, when you've got to go to war, you're a man. <laughs> no, 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 no more of this nonsense. It, it was September last year. Um, I don't remember the exact date. Okay, well then, uh, now I've got because I've forgotten the name of the age. So, so I, I want to know how that's going to work because somebody who has actually uh, had a, a acceptance as being a trans woman, a, a male with the additional protected characteristic of gender assignment, you'd say here. Um, he has to sign up for the draft. How does he serve if he is then drafted, which God forbid? Uh, but if he's called up, how does he then serve? Does he serve as a as if he were female, or does he? You know, how, do you know how that works, Carol? Well, it's complicated, and I'm not sure of the current state of things. But during the previous administration, there was an announcement that members of the armed services would have to serve in alignment with their sex. Oh, and right. the uh, uh, all the Democrats got really mad and said like, it was referred to, the Democrats referred to it as a trans military ban. And it said that the government was gonna ban trans people from serving in the military. That never happened. That was never the deal. The deal was that people were going to have to serve as their actual sex, by which I mean, you know, comply with the rules that apply to members of your sex. Women right. in the female barracks, men in the male barracks, that kind of thing. Um, I I believe that's gone now. I think Biden um, got rid of that. I don't know, I'd have to check. I'm not sure of the exact state of that. But I mean, you're pointing out, you know, th th this is one of the problems with pretending that sex isn't real. Yeah. And, and you cover this really well in your book. You talk about the origins of it all, Foucault and Butler, um, and talking about the sort of turning the, the, the understanding of reality upside down, effectively, uh, and, and making it absolute nonsense. So you know, it's, it's really well worth looking at, uh, at the abolition of sex. And I know I'm looking forward to seeing the reckoning when it comes out. Um, Thank I, I, you so much. Can I, we add something there because then again this is twitter stuff i wish you would they were saying so because it's the us cara but they were saying that some of these guys who are in the services they'd been given female um they'd been given they would they didn't have to do the male fitness routine they had to do female and all sorts this this was what i'd seen on twitter and then uh, as people were discovering this this was causing a great deal of stress to, you know, annoyance to Americans. You mean there are guys who join the US military and then call themselves a woman and they don't have to run around for an hour in the heat with a 160 pound backpack. They're allowed to run with the woman's backpack. This is what they're saying. I'm just saying, obviously, if, if this is true and it gets out, this would cause a bit of a fuss, wouldn't it? <laughs> it, it would cause a bit of a fuss if anybody knew. But the yeah. problem is none of this stuff gets reported. Okay, well, I don't... So, um, so Alison, I'm going to have to go in just a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just ask you, has anybody else got any more questions? Because we do have to uh, draw things to a close shortly. I can't see any more questions coming up. Um, in which case, what I would like to, to, to do is, is to thank you all for your great questions and comments and, and uh, contributions. 
Um, we'll next meet on Monday the 9th of October. Uh, we're expecting to have Maggie Gibson, the Scottish poet, who's just edited a book of poems by a huge range of fantastic women poets. Some of them cancelled previously, um, but uh, not yet confirmed exactly who will be with her. Um, anyway, I think she'll be uh, light, focusing a light on an aspect of policy and practice relating to women and girls. Do look out for the announcement, or you can sign up to our website, liberalvoiceofwomen.org, and we'll send you out the invitation as soon as it comes out. Uh, we also want to hear from you with any policy-related issues or problems that you want us to raise. I just want to announce three things. It's our federal conference uh, for the Liberal Democrat Party coming up in uh, September, the 23rd to 26th of September in, Bra in Bournemouth. So please let us know if you'll be there, either in person or online. We should be having a live event there, chaired by Dame Jenny Murray, featuring Raquel Rosario Sanchez, uh, Vaishnavi Sundar, who is also a stalwart of WDI India, and Dr. Laura Favaro. Um, so if you want to come, to, if you're close enough to get to Bournemouth, do contact us early and, and uh, get a ticket. Obviously, we want, we want to get lots of uh, Liberal Democrats coming there as well. Um, we're also going to be at the Philia Women's Rights Conference in Glasgow, 13th to the 15th of October. So if you've got a ticket and you're coming, do uh, come and let us know that you're there. And uh, either somebody from uh, Liberal Voice of Women or from our partner organisation, LGB Liberal Forum, will be staffing a stall at the LGB Alliance Conference. That's in London on the 27th, 27th of October. So those are where you can see us actually live, not just on, uh, not just on, on Zoom. But I'd like to thank uh, Rachel, our technical staff, and the organizer, organizer of our event bright Zoom meetings. Thanks to, thanks to all of you for being part of a, a really great event. And most of all, to our speaker tonight, Kara Dansky. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Cheers. And we're all looking forward to reading the new book. You're so right. <laughs> we'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we're going to conference. Thanks, everybody. Good night. See you soon.